Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We have been on hiatus on the podcast working on special projects. So we're coming back with a very special guest, Mark Fisher. Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing good. Good. Then we are ready to dive into today's subject. And it begins, Mark, where we were talking. Ron Miscavige Sr. released his book, Ruthless. It's a tremendous book. Loved it. And uh, the church immediately, of course, put up a hate website on Ron. Called him every name in the book. But what caught my attention were a couple of things, Mark. Uh, and, and this hate website, if you haven't looked at it, uh, listeners, you should take a peek around it because anytime Scientology puts up a hate website, it's a look into the mind of David Miscavige and what's bothering him. And Mark, a couple things I noticed, and you drew my attention to as well. There's a video by Norman Starkey claiming that L. Ron Hubbard wanted David Miscavige to be in charge of the church. And and. What, what can you say about that? Well, I, I saw this uh, hate website after the fact, after the ABC 2020 show, and the uh, book came out, and I read the book. Uh, first of all, you know some of the things that are said on that hate website are ridiculous because they, they basically attacked Ron, uh, saying that he didn't know anything because he wasn't around during all the power, you know, the takeover of Scientology and when Miscavige was put in charge and all that jazz. But, you know, it's so ridiculous because there's so many people that are out that spoke to Ron or would speak to Ron, that he could get lots of information about what was going on. You know, like for me, me personally, I was interviewed for this book, you know. So, and I was right there during this whole time period working directly for uh, David Miscavige. So that was kind of ridiculous. But I started watching Norman Starkey's video because Norman was the, uh, you know, he'd been at uh, Author Services, Inc. as the... Um, uh, executive director, and then uh, when L. Ron Hubbard died, he was made the executor of L. Ron Hubbard's estate, and that happened like within the last few days of his life, okay? But I thought it was really funny because I'm watching this video where, where Norman is just going on and on and on about how it was always Mr. Hubbard's intention for David Miscavige to take over, and uh, he was a close and personal friend and ally, and why do I know this? Because I'm the executor of L. Ron Hubbard's estate, and what was really crazy and bullshit about that whole thing is the fact that Norman wasn't even around when Elrich died. He didn't even come up to the base to Creston until after he died. So he had no way of knowing what Elrich's intentions were in regards to David Miscavige. Yeah, and we also know from various written documents that originally an attorney named Norton Carno was going to be Elrond Hubbard's uh, executor. And apparently some change was made at the last minute. But let's go back earlier. Uh, on the story leading up to L. Ron Hubbard's death. David Miscavige is the cameraman at the base working on LRH's uh, tech films. So you see the picture of him on the Apple box, you know, Shelley's next to him, he's filming, right? Right. And then uh, he, over a period of time, he becomes action chief. Right. Now, is that is that is Action Chief really David Miscavige's first step into power in the church? What is Action Chief? What is it? The do? Action Chief is basically in Scientology management. If a, if there's a situation or something going on somewhere in the world, it could be in you know in Europe or in Australia or whatever. Um, Scientology management may send what they call a mission, which would have people uh, two at least two people on it, sometimes three or four. And they would actually put them on orders of what they needed to take care of to take care of the situation. And they would actually fire them out, send them on an airplane, and then have them go handle the situation. And then the action chief was the person who was responsible for overseeing and handling that mission to successful completion. So they would have a, what they call a mission operator who basically oversaw that and would get a daily briefing in terms of what they were getting done in Australia or Europe or wherever they were, and then would give them further directions to keep them to their mission orders so that they successfully complete them. And that's what the action chief is. Now, what's, what's really funny about this is that, you know, Dave Miscavige was uh, the cameraman, and this is when he was in the Commodore's Messenger Org, and they were at uh, W, which was the location in La Quinta, and he basically was handling the cameraman duties, uh, you know, while L. Ron Hubbard was uh, shooting his tech films un until he went into hiding because of the IRS. They got word that the place was going to get raided, and he took off and, and went into hiding. 
So, you know, Miscavige, the Commodore's Messenger organization, they had nothing to do really with management at that time. They just were simply there to work where L. Ron Hubbard, uh, handling his traffic and, uh, you know, doing the technical films and whatever it is that he was interested in. But at the time, L. Ron Hubbard set up what was called a watchdog committee, and the watchdog committee was made up of senior messengers who would oversee management while he was off on the run doing whatever the hell he was doing. So the watchdog committee was what uh, started issuing orders to Scientology management at the time. I was in Scientology management at the time. And instead of coming from L. Ron Hubbard, they were coming from the watchdog committee. Okay? And that was just basically a front, you know, some way for them to send uh, orders into the church. Now, this is crucial. L. Ron Hubbard uh, needs to go into hiding. Yeah, and this is this is and, circa 1980, 81, 82 in that in that area there. Um, you know what I mean? This is uh, David Miscavige. Uh, actually, it's 1980 because Miscavige actually made his bones as the action chief at that time because um, at the time uh, L. Ron Hubbard ordered uh, when he went into hiding that the Commodore's Messenger organization were to run individual org. Uh, sorry, individual missions to every Scientology organization in order to get them turned around. And the uh, the messengers had to leave W and they moved to the, actually the the Big Blue in PAC in the in, in the L.A. area. And that's where they were based. And that's when Al, um, you know Miscavige was the action chief. And then missionaries started coming from Florida and all over the place. They'd be briefed in California and then they'd be sent out. I went on to a couple of those missions and many people did that. So that's when it started. It was 1980. And this was before or any geo takeover or anything like that. Now that timeline is interesting. Now, I, I wrote a, an article for uh, the Underground Bunker. Tony Ortega posted it, and my article is entitled "Scientology Claims Lauren Hubbard Chose David Miscavige to Succeed Him, Proving He Didn't." And I want to get into this because what we're going to get into are the lies of David Miscavige, and they're very specific. And what I based my article on was a declaration David Miscavige gave in a 1994 court trial. Fishman Gertz, uh, the church sued uh, Stephen Fishman and his uh, psychologist or psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Gertz, if you remember that case. Yes. So Miscavige, in, and we're going to post it with the podcast, Miscavige gives a declaration and he actually gives very specific timelines which are at odds with what is said on the Ron Miscavige hate website. Right. So, so for example, in Miscavige's timeline, okay, when Miscavige is, is in the 1994 declaration, he said that L. Ron Hubbard was out of touch with the church, he, quote, out of communication and uninvolved in church activities, unquote, from July 1979 to July 1981. So Miscavige out of his own mouth said that LRH, the old man Commodore, call him what you want, was out of touch from July 79 to July 1981. True or false? From my recollection, that is correct, because he had left the, uh, the W base in 79. So that whole period where he was running, uh, David Miscavige was the action chief, that did start in late 79, 80. So that's really more the time period that was there. So that's correct. And then L. Ron Hubbard, didn't, uh, we didn't find out that he was back on the line until sometime during 1981, because that's when uh, some... Um, orders came down to the watchdog committee and to the commoner's messenger to get him a report on the international management statistics and what was going on while he was gone. And then also I know that too because at that time I was in charge of approving every evaluation that was done by management and we got every organization in March uh, 1981 uh, evaluated for the first time and had everyone with a current evaluation and that had never been done before and that was actually sent up to L. Ron Hubbard in March of 81 for his birthday and he acknowledged that when he wrote down uh, when, when he actually uh, you know communicated again that he had heard that that had happened. Okay now in this period where L. Ron Hubbard is out of touch and uninvolved in church activities the uh, MCCS the Mission Corporate Category Sortout is being done. Mm -hmm. Now, this is being performed by, by Hubbard's lawyers. So what gets created is the Church of Scientology International as the new mother church, which means Church of Scientology California is no longer the mother church. Right. And now, what also gets created is the Religious Technology Center and the Church of Spiritual Technology. Now, on November 1, 1981, Church of Scientology International was founded. 
November 1, 1981, David Miscavige is still in the Church of Scientology International. However, Miscavige said in 1994 that at the beginning of 1982, L. Ron Hubbard transferred him over to become the CEO of the for-profit Author Services Incorporated. Right. So do you, do you remember when Miscavige moved from what would have been CMO to ASI? Yeah, well, my... my personal recollection was because I was I was up at the gold international based in you know in San Jacinto you know Gilman Hot Springs at that time for training and Miscavige was the action chief at that time he was part of CMO Int I mean this, the commanding officer of the Commerce Messenger Org was his direct senior okay but lots of different things were going on at that time because he was you know he was handling the communication line to Pat Broker and to L. Ron Hubbard so he was able to get certain people removed he got uh, D.D. Riesdorf removed as the uh, commanding officer of the, of the Commodore's Messenger Org and replaced by her sister, Gail Irwin. And then eventually he got rid of Gail and then posted a guy named John Nelson on there. And he did that because he was in a position that uh, he was not only the action chief CMO int, but he also was running special projects. Right, which was the, doing the corporate sort out and doing the whole uh, guardian's office uh, changeover into o, uh, the office of special affairs, and uh, so he was uh, um, called special project ops, and what that meant was he was a special project operator. He was the mission operator over the special project, and he was known. He actually wasn't known as COB in those days. He was known as special project ops. That was actually his his title that everybody knew, but that title. Um, you know, he had power because he had the communication line via Pat Broker to L. Ron Hubbard from that position. So that he, it allowed him to oversee the corporate sort out and allowed him to oversee any actions that WDC wanted done in management, okay? Uh, but then, like you said, at a certain point, once the corporate sort out came up with Author Services, which was a, a for-profit corporation to handle L. Ron Hubbard's literary affairs and financial concerns, he was then moved over and became the, uh, the uh, chairman of the board of uh, um, Author Services. Okay, and here, here's where the contradictions begin between what's being said in the Ron Miscavige Sr. Hate website, what, Ms., uh, what Dave Miscavige said in his 1994 declaration. So th this is where you can help me out. And well, I, I can, I can tell, you, tell you, I mean, it's, it's actually pretty simple. I mean, if you think about the corporate sort out, you know, I mean, he told apparently the IRS that he then became the, the chairman of the board of author services, right? And he no longer had any control over management because he said that in the declaration I saw in the uh, article that, that uh, it was on Tony Ortega's site and also for, uh, the quote from his declaration that Vaughn Young said that, you know, he had, you know, control over management. He denies saying that he ever had any, he didn't have any control then. But that is complete and utter BS. Okay, and I know that for a fact because I actually was around during that time period, and then became it, it got to the point where L. Ron Hubbard, or not L. Ron Hubbard, um, uh, Miscavige was going into, and he was controlling everything. Not only was he over at Author Services, but he still used the ter the uh, the um, post title of special project ops to then say, well, I'm also working in Scientology and I'm also working in the management of Scientology so I can do those things over there. And what happened is, is that uh, L. Ron Hubbard came up with this order that was issued to him in late um, 1983, which was basically to set up for corporate purposes, a corporate liaison office between author services and the church because the idea was is that author services people, they needed to get things done in the church because that's where they got their money. They got a large percentage of their money for L. Ron Hubbard from his book royalties and all the different fees and stuff that he would charge. So they, they wanted to have control going into the church that way, but corporately they shouldn't have been able to do that. It should have been an arm's length transaction. Well, Miscavige was just, he would just cross that right, left, and center, and he'd always be in there. Well, this corporate liaison office was an idea of L. Ron Hubbard's that he had Miscavige run past the attorneys to set up this office as sort of a buffer between ASI, Author Services, and uh, the Church of Scientology International, and it would serve as a facility differential for Miscavige and for Author Services so that they could issue orders or uh, projects or things that they wanted done in Scientology that then I could then, uh, that the corporate liaison office then could make sure happened or were getting done, okay? And I was chosen for that position to, in order to, to head that office. Now, what is the... 
liaison office between Church of Scientology International and Author Services called? It was called the Corporate Liaison Office. It was L. Ron Hubbard's idea. And uh, basically, not only was it set up to be sort of like a, a buffer between ASI and, and the Church of Scientology International, but we also were supposed to be a facility for David Miscavige because he worked so hard. We're, so we, we handled his administrative functions, his office functions, uh, his birthing, his living uh, functions, and his food, and anything that he needed. And we had an office um, uh, set up in at Golden Era Productions at the International Management Base, and then also one in Los Angeles because he was in Los Angeles as well. So I had to get staff for both of them. We had people in L.A., and we had people up at the, uh, at the international base. You have David Miscavige saying in his declaration that he couldn't possibly run Mr. Hubbard's personal business affairs and run the church at the same time. That's what he claimed. He says, quote, Accordingly, in 1982, Author Services was formed to manage the personal affairs of L. Ron Hubbard, including his literary, financial, and legal matters. As I was held in some regard by Mr. Hubbard, I was given the opportunity to be part of this new endeavor. Beginning in 1982, I devoted my full time and attention to Mr. Hubbard's personal affairs from my position as Chief Executive Officer of Author Services. Robert Von Young's contention that I was somehow managing all Scientology churches internationally at the same time that I was supervising Mr. Hubbard's affairs is preposterous. From the beginning of 1982 until March of 1987, I was Chief Executive Officer and later Chairman of the Board of Author Services Incorporated, a California corporation which managed the personal business and literary affairs of L. Ron Hubbard, unquote. So that's David Miscavige denying. He's basically saying it's preposterous. I can't run the Church of Scientology internationally and Mr. Hubbard's legal, financial, and literary affairs. So that's completely false. Uh, he's not telling the truth there. And the reason I know that is because I was set up, like I said, as this corporate liaison office in 1983, and uh, Miscavige would go back and forth between L.A. and the international base, and he was – you know, personally responsible for overseeing all of the, you know, actions at Golden Era Productions and, and International Management and the Executive Director International and any Scientology product that was going out, he had to personally approve any communication going to L. Ron Hubbard from Scientology Management, from a messenger that was uh, working down in the, the movie studio, you name it, to L. Ron Hubbard's laundry, had to personally go through David Miscavige and be approved by him before it could ever go to L. Ron Hubbard for him to see or or, or authorized or approve, you know, and that no. had nothing to do with author services, what he was doing. He was doing stuff that had to do with Scientology management, and he did it from an office that was provided for by me. I was paid by uh, uh, Church Scientology International. That was the other thing that L. Ron Hubbard said in the dispatch. He said, the church can pay for this because, you know, they should, why should we have to pay for this service? Uh, the church will pay for it as uh, Church Scientology International. So all the staff and all that, we were paid by the church. Everything had to go through Miscavige, including L. Ron Hubbard's laundry? Absolutely. Yeah, he had a whole household unit, and we would get things that down, sent down that he had made, and that we had messengers on duty at the international base that personally had to hand wash the stuff over and over and over and over. You can hear horror stories from the people who used to be involved with it because it had to be 100% odor-free and smell-free. And L. Ron Hubbard at that point had become psychotic on the on – the, uh, on scents and, and, and things that smelled, uh, he didn't like perfume. Anything We had to use unscented uh, everything, unscented deodorant, unscented shampoo. Anything with a scent around him, he could not take it. So, you know, anything that he bought or any clothing that was bought had, a, you know, some sort of uh, perfume or dye in it. It had to be washed, hand-washed, and smell-tested. And it would be smell-tested by the senior messenger on duty. And then it would go to uh, the COCMO International, Mark Yeager. And then it would go to uh, the, the traffic liaison, which was Mark Yeager's wife. And then to David Miscavige. And then once he approved it, then it would go on the run up to L. Ron Hubbard. Now, this is something for new Scientology watchers. This is really interesting. L. Ron Hubbard began to smell scents, especially rose rose, scented, rose perfume. Per yeah, and he claimed that psychiatrists were somehow infiltrating rose-scented perfumes into clothing, and that this was diabolical somehow. Now, as I've heard the story, his shirts would be washed in 14 separate buckets of water, rinsed. That's correct. We built, a, we built up at Bonneview the house at the Gold Base for L. Ron Hubbard's return, a full 
professional laundry, like you would see like at a laundry with like professional washing machines, professional dry cleaning machines, professional pressing machines, you name it, right? Well, guess what? That stuff didn't work to get the smell out to his satisfaction. So everything had to be hand washed, like you said, through huge plastic trash cans and soaked with all these different chemicals in order to get that uh, the perfume out. And, uh, and then it would be rinsed and rinsed and rinsed. These poor messengers on duty would be up there night and day to get these things done to the point where it could pass a smell test. So David Miscavige is micromanaging L. Ron Hubbard's laundry. Yes. And at the same time, he's saying he doesn't have anything to do with the church, even though you have church people doing the laundry. Yes, but he also did have the things to do with the church as well, because like, um, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, in a comment that I wrote on that article is that, you know, he personally you know, oversaw and removed two executive directors international, uh, two commanding officers, CMO Ints, command, uh, who were also WDC chairman, Watchdog Committee chairman. He personally ordered them removed and saw them removed. I mean, he was responsible for the mission holder, uh, you know, re revolution that, that basically got rid of the entire Scientology mission network and the International Finance Police. Now, I know we're going to go into details on these things, but he actually ran these people. He was in charge. They answered only to him, yet he supposedly was the chairman of the board of Author Services International, which is a for-profit corporation. No, that's not, that's not correct. Yeah, and just to, to elaborate on uh, Author Services International, it is a California co corporation. It's privately owned. It has shareholders, not a lot of shareholders, but the IRS during uh, Scientology's 1991-1023 application for IRS tax exemption, the IRS asked about the private ownership. And really the, the shares of author services are held by ASI staff. They can't be sold. There's no dividend paid. It's just to comply with California law that a corporation has to have shares. Now, here's an interesting thing, Mark. The Sea Org is a religious order, an unincorporated religious order that doesn't legally exist. It doesn't have an address. It doesn't have a bank account. According to David Miscavige's attorney, it can't give or receive orders because it has no one to give or receive orders. And th this was uh, Lamont Jefferson in Rathbun versus Miscavige said that. So here's a couple problems. You cannot have members of a religious order working in a for-profit corporation. They're, they're two unlike things. They're not allowed. Right. So when you when David Miscavige worked for Author Services, was he still in the Sea Org? As far as I knew, he was. But I've also heard that, um, that I, and I don't know this for a fact, I also heard that the people that went over to work to Author Services who were in the Sea Org had to resign from the Sea Org in order to be paid because they all of a sudden were going to be paid minimum wage plus bonuses by L. Ron Hubbard personally, and they could no longer be paid by the church. Okay. Now, I don't know that for a fact because I never worked at Author Services, but some staff members there might be able to verify that. But no, they, they, they actually were... They were, they were still considered Sea Org members, though. That was the thing. See, I mean, David Miscavige may not have been, um, he may have been over at Author Services, but he was still a captain in the Sea Organization. He still had a rank. Do you know what I mean? Some of these people were still commanders. Norman Starkey, who was working over at Author Services, he still was a commander right arm, which meant he, he could pilot a, a, a Scientology vessel. Okay, they had these things, and whether or not they say, oh, they can't, the Sea Org is, you know, this uh, fraternity that can, you know, basically has no space or anything like that, that'd be like saying, that'd be like saying a captain in the Navy can't order a sailor in the Navy, in the United States Navy, because, they're, uh, they're, you know, even though they're working in another position and field, that that sailor isn't going to follow that captain's orders. Of course, they're going to follow those captain's orders because they're, they're higher rank than they are. So in practicality, they can say whatever they want in theory, but in actual practicality, if Miscavige came into your office and you were a Sea Org member and he told you something, it w you would do it. And not only that, if you didn't do it the way he liked it, he would cream you. You'd be removed from po your position uh, in your post. You could be sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force. Let's get to a couple interesting things. The Mission Holder Massacre occurred in 1982 when David Miscavige was in author services. Mm -hmm. So he's saying he has nothing to do with managing the Church of Scientology International, yet in another document we'll post, it's a PDF called the Sea Organization Expansion News, the Sea Org Moves In, 
This shows David Miscavige in Sea Org uniform in 1982 managing the affairs of the church. He, they're at the San Francisco Hilton Hotel, and you have uh, Lyman Spurlock, Mark Yeager, David Miscavige, Norman Starkey, Marlo, uh, Guillaume, and Ray Midoff. Right. So these are all, with the exception of David Miscavige, the rest of these people are Church of Scientology International. No, They're that's WC. not true. No. Norman Starkey okay. and Lyman Spurlock are also author services. Oh, oh, thank you for the thank you for the correction. So you have, then what you have is people from Author Services International right. at a church function, uh, the so-called Mission Massacre. Legally, they're not supposed to be there, are they? I mean, this is Mr. Hubbard's personal affairs management company. They work for the at that time. They work for a for-profit organization, uh, Author Services Incorporated. Uh, and uh, like Lyman Spurlock was in charge of all of L. Ron Hubbard's accounts and money and financial affairs. And uh, Norman Starkey, I think, was the deputy executive director at the time. Terry Gamboa was the executive director. And David Miscavige was the, the uh, chairman of the board of the Religious Technology uh, – sorry, not Religious Technology Center, of Author Services Incorporated. So all three of them were working for the for-profit. The only people that were there for uh, uh, Church Scientology International were Mark Yeager, he almost saved as Edient and Ray Medoff as the senior CS International. Steve Marlowe was from the Religious Technology Center. He was the only person in the Religious Technology Center in those days. There was maybe him and one other person. Then this is an this is what you would call an out point. Ms. Ms. Gavage has, has tried to claim he's not the managing agent of the church. In, in other words, this seems to pierce the corporate veil because ASI is not supposed to be able to order into the Church of Scientology International. Right. I mean, but, they have no they have no corporate control over the Church of Scientology International. But in actuality, even this is this uh, this newsletter that came out, it's the Sea Org is here to save the day, and it totally contradicts what the attorneys have said about the Sea Org because these guys are in there as Sea Org members. That's why they're all in uniform in order to order declares and, and declaring suppressive people private Scientology mission holders, okay? They, they, they're just going in there and they're doing what the hell they want. Yet they, corporately, they're not set up to do that. U.S. tax court said that the uh, church was set up, uh, and this was, I, I think, 92 when they denied the Church of Spiritual Technology's application for tax exemption. Mm -hmm. They said that the Church of Scientology was set up as a deceptive business. Meaning it was, you know, it was kind of a deceptive setup. Ruled that this the church was run really through the Sea Org, and that it didn't really matter to say that the Sea Org doesn't confer any rank because the Sea Org actually runs things. So, would you say that the way it works in the Church of Scientology is that the Sea Org actually runs everything? That's yeah, that that's correct. And during my time period in here, that that's that's the way it was. If you think about it, I mean, the whole purpose, the whole purpose of the corporate sort out was to basically set up a shell game because everybody knew who was in the Sea Organization that L. Ron Hubbard was the Commodore of the Sea Org, and L. Ron Hubbard was the founder of Scientology, and he was ordering on a daily basis when he was on the Apollo, when he was at W. Uh, you know, any of those times, he was ordering management and telling them what to do. He was doing the research for the technical aspects of Scientology, and he set all that up, and then out of that, he got money back to him, and that was the whole purpose of the corporate sword out, was to protect L. Ron Hubbard, because the IRS's theory was, is that L the Scientology and the Sea Org was all set up to shuffle money to L. Ron Hubbard. And to be honest with you, that was a major portion of what they were doing. And let's just call a spade a spade. That's what was happening. And they used the C organization as basically their way of getting around the corporate sort out by saying it's the fraternal organization that doesn't exist so therefore we can do whatever the heck we want and we're a religion and so we can do this right but they didn't have religious status at that point there was no religious status they were trying to get it at that point so what they were doing was they were violating their own corporate sort out right then and there returning to David Miscavige's 1994 uh, declaration mm -hmm. He says that, um, quote, Mr. Hubbard went completely out of touch with any and all church entities from May 1984 until he passed away in January of 1986, unquote. Now, the reason I mention this, Mr. Hubbard puts David Miscavige at author services in January 82. 
leaves him there. Now, according to David Miscavige, Mr. Hubbard goes out of touch from May 1984 until he dies in January 1986. So when Eric Lieberman, longtime Scientology attorney, top constitutional lawyer in the U.S., claims that Mr. Hubbard wanted David Miscavige to take the church over, he doesn't produce any documentation to prove it. He claims that they have things from Mr. Hubbard. What he, sa he says, quote, Mr. Lieberman says, quote, we have document documented statements by Elrond Hubbard, tapes by Elrond Hubbard, affidavits by Elrond Hubbard saying, David Miscavige has assumed an essential position of leadership in this church. He is my good friend, and I call upon all of you to trust him because he is the person who has taken over the mantle and will continue to do so, unquote. Well, I challenge Mr. Lieberman to produce and post online that documentation. But, but here's my problem, Mark. If Elrond Hubbard went out of touch with the church, uh, in 1984, uh, as David Miscavige said, May of 1984, mm -hmm. then that means L. Ron Hubbard never appointed David Miscavige to run the Church of Scientology or inherit the mantle or anything, because as of May 1984, when he went out of touch with everybody, he left David Miscavige at Author Services International to handle his personal, literary, and business affairs if we are to make, take Miscavige at his word in his 1994 declaration. That's correct. And he did go out of, out of touch at a certain point. I don't remember the exact date, May 1984, may be correct. But he did go out of communication, except there still would be runs. Traffic would be sent to Pat Broker. Miscavige from time to time would meet with Pat Broker to see the locations and pass things along. It's just that we weren't receiving any direction back from L. Ron Hubbard. And I think the only thing that we got, and I'm not sure the dates on it, were recordings of, of Ron's journals for like the New Year or something like that. I'll never forget that there was a Ron's journal that came down and it had been a couple of years or a year or so since we'd heard one and his voice to me sounded very frail. And this is shortly before he died. He sounded very frail and not like himself. I remember uh, distinctly remembering that at the time. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, there was no there was no other, you know, orders or directions that were coming down. And during that time period, as you state, I up until the day L. Ron Hubbard died, David Miscavige was the chairman of the board of Author Services, okay? And he did not see L. Ron Hubbard before he died. He wasn't up at the Creston Ranch when L. Ron Hubbard died. There was only one Sea Org member that was up there, and that was Ray Midoff, along with Gene Dank and Sarge, um, uh, Sarge uh, Steve Foff, and Annie Broker. They were the only people that were up there, okay? So, you know, if there were any directions given, they weren't given directly to, L. Ron, uh, to David Miscavige by L. Ron Hubbard. No, and you would think that if Elrond Hubbard wanted uh, David Mascavige to inherit the mantle, he would have put it in writing. Because Mr. Hubbard said, if it's not in writing, it's not true. Correct. And the only thing that came out in writing after he died was when they did the death event. As they read it, the, the next day, that loyal officer uh, issue came out appointing uh, Pat Broker and Annie Broker as loyal officers. Okay, and uh, it, it was assumed it was written by L. Ron Hubbard. He was going off to Target Two or whatever, right? And you know, we assume because it was you know was put out in L. Ron Hubbard's name that he wrote it. Okay, it wasn't shortly thereafter after you know the things settled down. Miscavige started telling me and telling Norman Stark and other people that that was that was, it was a forgery that it, that L. Ron Hubbard didn't write it, and he just sort of intimated the fact that you know Pat Broker, you know that uh, you, you know he was trying to undermine Pat Broker at the time because we all assumed that Pat and Annie Broker were going to take over, and as a matter of fact, I had to do various actions to get personnel up to the Creston Ranch for Pat Broker and Annie Broker because Pat's Pat's plan was to continue the ranch, the horse ranch up there, and David Miscavige and Norman, and they were going like, what the hell do we need a horse ranch for? We've got to run Scientology. So they thought Pat Broker was completely off the rails in regards to that, because he just wanted to continue doing whatever he was doing, and L. Ron Hubbard was gone. There was no reason for him to do that anymore. Pat Broker wanted to be a gentleman horse rancher. Right, and see, so and I, was, I was still in the corporate liaison office after L. Ron Hubbard died. Miscavige did not move over to the church until he took over RTC in whatever that was, 1987 or whatever, right? He, he still was an author services chairman of the board, but he still retained the title of special project ops in the Sea Org. 
if you want, if you will. Okay. So I was still being paid by uh, Church of Scientology International, as was all of our staff, right? But then I also had then at that point, Miscavige started assigning me to do duties for Norman Starkey as the executor of L. Ron Hubbard's estate, which included getting personnel up to the Creston Ranch for Pat and Annie Broker, and I sent about 20 people up there uh, to you know to man man the different positions they needed up there at the ranch. I had no idea what they were. Those people eventually, after Miscavige took over RTC. Those people all got sent back and got sent to the RPF because they now were quote unquote you know allies of Pat Broker you know. But let's look at the situation because this is very fascinating. Miscavige uh, has no clear mandate from L. Ron Hubbard to take over the church. In fact, when L. Ron Hubbard dies, everybody thinks Pat and Annie Broker are going to take over the church. Right, and Miscavige didn't take over. Right, <clears throat> if he had a clear mandate, why didn't he take over? That's what's so ridiculous about these attorney statements. If L. Ron Hubbard died and wanted Miscavige to take over, how come he didn't take over right away? That's the exact question that Eric Lieberman cannot answer. Right. But, but, but what's, what's interesting from my point of view is you have uh, the loyal officers issue, which was taken as a real issue by Hubbard, mm -hmm. and you have Pat and Annie at the ranch and Pat wanting to be a gentleman rancher. Right. And this creates a, 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 almost an intolerable situation, I imagine, where – where David Miscavige doesn't have the mandate, he has not inherited the mantle, there's no document, he's running only the personal literary and business affairs of, of uh, L. Ron Hubbard on paper. Correct, and then the other factor is that Annie Broker was the inspector general of RTC, so she was in charge of the Religious Technology Center, and Vicki Azaran was the deputy in, uh, in inspector general, Jesse Prince, and they had a whole huge organization, and their job was to oversee Scientology management, and David Miscavige had no control over that organization because he had no control over Annie, and then Annie and Pat were... Uh, you know, weren't under his control. So he felt out of control of that. So that's how he had to kind of weasel his way into how could he get rid of Pat and Annie. And that's what, that's how he eventually took over. But if, 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 if it was set up where he was supposed to take over in the first place, he wouldn't have had to do that. So would you say, Mark, that David Miscavige was the odd man out when L. Ron Hubbard died? Yeah, there was two factions. There was there was Miscavige, and he had his loyal officers, which were Norman Starkey, the author of services, and Mark Yeager as the COCMO int, and then uh, Guillaume Lusserv as the ED int, only because he had to follow whatever international management wanted to do. And then on the other side, you had Pat Broker, Annie Broker, Vicky Asnaran, and Jesse Prince. You know what I mean? And th so they had, they were, that was the factions. And basically RTC was set up to oversee management. Well, DM didn't have control over that anymore. So he basically had no control over overseeing management. So he basically did what the hell he wanted anyway and just ignored Pat and Annie until such time as he could get the leverage that he needed to get rid of them. And, th and that was partly by uh, denouncing the loyal officers that she was a fraud. So uh, he, did, uh, he did that behind the scenes. It was sort of, sort of like a whisper campaign, you know. It didn't well, actually get, I mean, it didn't actually get uh, canceled until I think uh, you know our, the RTC takeover happened. So it was behind, it was a behind the scenes erosion of Pat and Annie. Yeah. Now now I've heard a story. It may or may not be true. I'm asking you. Supposedly, Annie Broker was sec checked and admitted that the oil officers issue was a forgery. I don't know because I didn't. Have previous, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, who knows? That's what okay, they I'll say. Praise. That's what they say. But you know, they also say L. Ron Hubbard signed his will. I know there's a whole dispute about his will on his deathbed. How could he do that when he was when he was, you know, succumbed by a, by the strokes that he had had? I mean, that's what I'm saying. I, I mean, there's lots of rumors as to what is what. Who knows? Well, for 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 new Scientology watchers, let me get some some immediate uh, context. On one of my podcasts, I talked to Bill Franks. And I love talking to Bill Franks. He's so knowledgeable. He related the story that uh, Dr. Uh, Gene Dunn confided to him in 1980 that L. Ron Hubbard was developing dementia. He's beginning to lose it. Mm -hmm. Now, in the coroner's report, which I have on the Scientology Money Project, you just go to the article, The Truth About the, the Death of L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard had dementia the last few years of his life, it got more serious. He began to develop dysphagia, slurring of speech, inability to read written materials. And this is noted in the Sheriff Coroner's report. Mm -hmm. It's documented. And he did have a stroke. It was very debilitating. It's maybe a week before he died. And um, 
this is when we begin to get visceral, the psychiatric tranquilizer. Right. And it's given to older people who are in distress because they know they're dying. It was sort of a hospice drug. Mm -hmm. That's my sense. It was given as sort of a hospice drug to help ease, ease Mr. Hubbard's passing. And uh, there would be nothing wrong with that except Mr. Hubbard's opposition to psychiatric drugs. So the day before L. Ron Hubbard died, here you, here's a couple out points. You have you have an elderly man who's had a stroke. He's on a psychiatric medication. The sheriff coroner said, was he did he have the mental capacity to, to sign a new will the day before he died? And the reason the sheriff coroner noted that was in case it became an issue later, in case there was a lawsuit over the uh, the last will and testament of L. Ron Hubbard, the right. final one. Right. So obviously L. Ron Hubbard's has diminished mental capacity, he has pancreatitis, he smokes, he's not in the best of health. Mm -hmm. And so Miscavige is sort of running his affairs for him. And this would be very much, uh, it wouldn't be unusual at all to think of Miscavige maybe as a conservator, mm -hmm. you know, run, running an elderly man's affairs for him mm -hmm. and trying to, to at least keep L. Ron Hubbard's affairs in order because when someone's older, they may, they may not be mentally competent around their affairs. Right. And there's sort of an undertone here, if you read the Sheriff Coroner's report and Dr. Denk's remarks about L. Ron Hubbard's declining health. So when Ron dies and Miscavige doesn't have a clear mandate, here's what I think happened. And, and I'll, I'll run it by you and you can just tell me what you think, okay? All right. L. Ron Hubbard dies, David Miscavige does not have a clear mandate to take over. But what does he have? He has experience, particularly David Miscavige was ordered by L. Ron Hubbard to destroy the guardian's office, to dismantle the guardian's office. Mm -hmm. Correct? That's right. So, okay, so he's been, he's been in a power play before where he had to take on Mary Sue Hubbard. Right. He's, Miscavige and company are actually the ones that caved in Mary Sue Hubbard and got her to resign from the guardian's office. She tried to take back her resignation, but they got her to resign again. They got her off the lines, and then, and then Miscavige and company began to dismantle, take apart, declare, ban, do whatever they want to take out the guardian's office. Mm -hmm. In fact, Miscavige claimed in his 1994 declaration that L. Ron Hubbard was off lines when he was dismantling the guardian's office. So because Miscavige and company had experience in taking down the guardian's office. You mentioned there's two factions when L. Ron Hubbard died within the church. There's David Miscavige and company and then the people in RTC. That's correct. So now you're, you're, which faction are you in when Mr. Hubbard dies? I'm, I'm on Miscavige's side because I work for him. Now, was there a feeling in the Miscavige faction since you were in it? And that's really fascinating that you had to take out this other faction. Was it understood or implied, or was it talked about? It was. It was always. It was implied. It was never directly stated because uh, RTC was actually Religious Technology Center was actually based mostly up at the international base, and my office was right next to theirs. And I knew Vicky Asneran, and I knew Jesse Prince. We were friends, and so I was friendly with all these people. So there, there was never any like, oh, let's tell Fisher about what we're going to do to take over RTC. That was all masterminded author services with Marty Rathbun and Norman Starkey and David Miscavige. Okay, But I would get directions from Miscavige from time to time to do things that I thought were a little strange, and he would make, make sure to tell me, uh, don't say anything to Vicky or Jesse or if it, Pat, I mean, he says, I don't care, Pat Broker, anybody having to do that, they come at you, you keep it quiet. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? And the main one, the biggest one was when uh, Miscavige took over all the uh, supposedly OT materials, all of L. Ron Hubbard's auditing files. When those were confiscated by private investigators, he, he called me up in the middle of the night, about two in the morning. At my, I had a private line in my bedroom. And he said, go up uh, and meet Marty and uh, uh, Norman and they've got a truck of, of materials of file cabinets and they're going to be locked away in the in the uh, safe room and he said I want you to then change the locks to the safe room and no one is to be allowed in there except me and then he goes I don't care if Pat broker Annie broker uh, you know Vicky or Jesse anybody asked to get in there you cannot let them in and you're the only person that has the lock now what now what these were actually Aaron Hubbard's 
auditing materials, auditing up folders up. and stuff that they that Pat Broker was keeping as leverage because there were supposedly the OT materials for OTs eight levels eight, nine, ten, and beyond. Okay, and that was no. that that was the main carrot that you know uh, Pat Broker was holding because he had those he had those hidden away from Miscavige, and you know that that was his that was his, his trump card in order to make sure that he could make stay in power. But Pat Broker what? was was in uh, D.C. with Miscavige meeting with attorneys on a business trip, and then what happened is Marty went to the location where the materials at and told the people that were there that there was an FBI raid and that they'd be contacted and that and they scared the shit out of them enough that they basically let them you know take the materials away. Oh, so Miscavige took. Pat Broker to Washington D.C. to get him Be, off the premises. Yeah, they were meeting with the attorneys, the church attorneys. <laughs> so it was all done, he, you know, surreptitious, you know, while you know while he, while they were there. As soon as they got to, uh, you know, Washington, they, uh, they called Marty, Marty, and went in there with the PIs, got the stuff, and then DM called me from DC, Washington D.C. and told me that I'm going to be receiving the stuff and that it was my responsibility to keep it secure. So you locked it all up. Yep. So you basically were the custodian of what supposedly OT eight, nine, and ten. Yeah, and beyond whatever it is that were in those file cabinets. There were it was a it was a semi truck. It was full of stuff. Now that had to be a rush for you, just on a personal basis. You're the only guy in the world with the, the key, the literal key to the safe room that has OT eight, nine, and ten. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty pretty wild having that stuff because it was right after that. Sure. I mean, I don't even remember how long after that, that the next thing I know, here comes the RTC reorganization, you know, Norman Starkey, Greg Wilhair, uh, DM, you know, Shelly showing up in the middle of the night and saying, get up at six o'clock in full dress uniform because we're taking over RTC. You know what I mean? It was like, it was like, like bing, bang, boom. It happened very quickly. Well, now this is, uh, you could say, repeating the successful action because Miscavige and company literally at St. Hill, they walked in and took over the Guardian's office, didn't they? Lock, locked everyone out of the offices? Yeah. Yeah, they had Pinkerton agents and stuff, you know, which were privatized at the time, you know, get all the, uh, you know, these geo staff out. So they, so he's done it before. Yeah, and, he, does, and he, was, he, he had the persona of a tough guy. You know, I mean, Miscavige, although he's short, he, you know, he, he, he had a tough guy mentality. And he scared people because, you know, he knew – and people knew that he'd done that at the Guardian's office before. So, therefore, there was no questioning that, you know, he knew what he was doing, you know. Uh, he had a reputation for being a tough guy. And, uh, and he had, literally, if you crossed him, you went to the RPF. And that happened to me personally as well. So, you know, before. So it's, it's just uh, – um, you know, nobody's going to question that. But I, I really felt that, you know, you know, I knew it was coming on that once he got those materials, boom, man, it was like, okay, these people are out. And then that whole day was, you know, Jesse Prince can tell you about that, but that whole morning was a fiasco, you know, uh, you know <laughs> Jesse's story with the guns and everything. I mean, it's pretty wild. Yeah, when, uh, well, but what happens? I mean, you you guys well, walked in and full dress. They didn't secure it, everything until around noon. I mean, I you know I came into my office around six in the morning, and then then the other you know all the uh, you know Will Hare, uh, Norman Starkey, Marty, and uh, DM Ray Midoff, and uh, Mark Yeager, they all came in and uh, and they were there, and then you know by the time that Vicky and Jesse were woken up and brought up to their offices and then they marched in in full full dress uniform and told them they were out and you know Jesse reacted very badly to it and you know you know it got a little physical apparently and he can tell that story really well and next thing you know he's he's gone back to his room and gotten a gun and uh tell him you know it's over my dead body you're taking me out of here you know what I mean and uh there was a lot a lot of you know a lot of a lot of drama going on and Vicky you know went and hid in a room and then ended up in a motel room in town and uh, you know uh, Marty had to go down and calm down uh, Jesse you know because so he wouldn't shoot anybody you know and then DM uh, sat down with him and convinced Jesse to go to the uh, re you know to the RPF it was a uh, wild they basically had to tell them that see uh, Vicky Azaran and Jesse Prince's power came from Pat Manny Broker because they were the they were the people that were you know particularly Annie who was the inspector general, and so they were told they were separate and they were basically a senior to Miscavige and everything else. And all of a sudden, Miscavige said, "Well, Annie's out." So that was like that was basically cut them out. And that's really how he 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 pulled the how he came into power was by by driving the old RTC out. 
Mm-hmm. And then he becomes the new... He's now the chairman of the board of RTC, and he, he quits at ASI, comes over to RTC. Uh, he orders me to do the organizational board for RTC based on admin tech and ethics. And um, basically, we set up an, an inspector general for admin, an inspector general for technology, an inspector general for ethics. And admin was Mark Gager, tech was Ray Midoff, and ethics was Marty Rathbun. And Greg Wilher was the, was the inspector general. And DM was over here as the chairman of the board of RTC. And then in his department, 20, uh, department 20 uh, was the corporate liaison office got moved in there. So I got put in there, and we, we be, all of a sudden became RTC staff. Amazing. So really... In your opinion, then, having been there as an eyewitness, Miscavige came to power through a coup absolutely. or a series yeah, of... Yeah, absolutely. It's a bloodless coup, but yes, a coup, nonetheless. Well, it's a palace coup. No, I know, but I'm just saying he didn't, didn't, he didn't yeah. go in there and shoot everybody, and they were dead, you know, and that's how he took over. Was, yeah, he, t- he took over. He muscled his way in. And L. Ron Hubbard never appointed him to take over the church. No, I mean, L. Ron Hubbard was dead and gone at that point, you know. Now, go, going back a little bit earlier, and with L. Ron Hubbard being dead, L. Ron Hubbard dies, Miscavige and company race up from uh, the base, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from Gold Base. They race up to Creston, California with attorney, attorney Earl, Earl Cooley. Mm-hmm. According to Robert Von Young, that weekend is where they concoct the story that L. Ron Hubbard laid down in his perfectly healthy body. Right. And he just, you know, magically floated out of his body. Right. So one thing I want to point out to Scientologists who are in the church, Miscavige begins his ascension with a lie. He lied deliberately about the death of L. Ron Hubbard. Earl Cooley lied about the death of L. Ron Hubbard. Everyone on that stage lied about how Mr. Hubbard died. L. Ron Hubbard was old and sick, and he died, and that happens. People get old and sick, and they die. There's no, no, no crime in that. But Miscavige is part of a conspiracy to say he needed to continue research and his body had become an impediment. So this healthy body, he laid down and willingly and causatively left the body. When you were at the Palladium event, the the LRH death event, what was your sense of what Miscavige and Cooley were saying? What was your sense? Well, being a true believer at that time, I was a true believer in Scientology and all of its technology. I accepted it hook, line, and sinker. Because, you know, the, the, the word also was is that he would come back in about 21 years. This, this wasn't that night, but later we were told that after he, he became old enough, he would come back to us. And in my mind, I thought, well, this will be the true test of uh, Scientology's claims of reincarnation. Because once L. Ron Hubbard comes back, and he's out, you know, we'll, we'll have absolute proof that there are past lives, you know. That's very interesting. What, when did you learn the real facts about how L. Ron Hubbard had died. About the the dying of a stroke and all that? Yeah. Not until after I left uh, the Sea Org. (laughs) Well, did you feel betrayed or lied to? How did you feel? Well, at the time, I mean, after I left, the first thing I did was, one of the first things I did was I read Russell Miller's uh, book, uh, Barefaced Messiah, which had been off limits. I didn't even know existed. But that book opened my eyes quite a bit to a lot of falsehoods about L. Ron Hubbard and things that bothered me about him. So then, therefore, when I found out later, I think it was when uh, the Fishman suit was going on, and Vaughn, I was close to Vaughn and Stacy Young, and they were telling me about, you know, uh, Vaughn had told me he'd gotten the uh, autopsy report and that L. Ron Hubbard had been taking Visteral and, and this and that, that I you know, started to go, okay, well, he's, he was getting old and something was going on there. And then finally, of course, uh, later on when, I guess, uh, Sarge, um, um, Steve Falf, you know, told his stories to Marty about how LRH really died. You know, that's how I really found out. Yeah, and it, and it is really quite something because they're they're trying to create a mythology to give some kind of continuity. And and it is a bet that L. Ron Hubbard will reincarnate. That buys them 21 years. Right. Where no one's going to, you know, really think anything. The true believers will think, yeah, 21 years he comes back. He'll probably come out of out of Vegas. Hubbard said he would come back as a political leader. So you, that well, would see, be... The thing was, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. When, the, when David Miscavige took over RTC and we did the reorganization, my personal feeling was is that we had the organization now set up the way it was supposed to be 
with a watchdog committee, with an executive director international, with the executive internationals, with an RTC with a, that was going to police and oversee the trademarks, with a CST that was going to preserve everything. I mean, he actually actively worked on that, and we worked on putting the people there in order to make that happen, okay? But then, uh, then like I said, what happened shortly after that was all of a sudden, you know, Miscavige starts, you know, getting more and more power and realizing he has more and more power, and he basically started to go nuts where he would just remove people left and right and figure he's, you know, going into his whole narcissistic, oh, I'm the only one who can do anything, et cetera, et cetera, and then people became a target. And I, my, my theory is once they got the IRS tax exemption in 93, which was after I left uh, Scientology, uh, my feeling is at that point he felt like he had complete control. Uh, nobody could stop him, and he could hide behind religious freedom and the First Amendment for the rest of his life, and basically then he could do whatever he wanted, and then he dismantled management after that. They end up in the hole, et cetera, et cetera, and you know all the, the, the time period after that. And then Scientology just became a donation machine where you know he realized that you know people could donate and donate and donate, and he didn't have to deliver any service. So he can have all the money in the world without having to deliver any service. So why does he need management? You know, it's just too hard to train auditors. It's too hard to, you know, man up staff and to pay staff. It's a lot easier to get a billionaire to donate $100 million, you know. When Miscavige went on stage at the famous The War is Over, We Got Tax Exemption speech, he really used that to legitimate, legitimatize his uh, having taken over the church. Right. But what people should notice especially Scientologists in the church, it's a non sequitur. It doesn't logically follow that because David Miscavige got the Church of Scientology tax exemption that he is L. Ron Hubbard's rightful heir. Right. In fact, a condition of L. Ron Hubbard's last will and testament is that CSI, RTC, CST had to become tax-exempt entities to keep the intellectual property. Right. Okay, that was just a, a, a condition, a legal condition of... of uh, his last will and testament. So it, it's a non sequitur. It doesn't legally follow because Miscavige had a team of lawyers, accountants, smart money people, and you know Fred Goldberg greenlighted uh, this 1023 review process. It doesn't follow. That doesn't make Miscavige anything but the guy who got them tax exemption. And which, by the way, I've said before, Mark, tax exemption is not like the Apollo 11 moon landing that. David Miscavige made it out to be a lot of deviant groups have tax exemption. Right, but the thing is is that it legitimized the whole financial makeup of Scientology from day one in 1950 when L. Ron Hubbard was charging money and fees for his services and then became a church, you know what I mean, in order to uh, you know avoid having to pay taxes. And then once they had that, uh, that tax exempt status, now all of a sudden the parishioners that were paying for services, all that was tax exempt. So that, that legitimized their whole money-making apparatus even more. Because they'd say, oh, well, just donate because it's going to be tax exempt anyway. You know, pre-pay for these things. Do your donations, you know. So it just legitimized their whole makeup. And it also protected them from what the IRS went after before, which was that all the money from Scientology was being set up there to, to, to inure to L. Ron Hubbard. Well, yes, yes and no. But let me, let me give you just something to think about, mm -hmm. our listeners to think about, especially Scientologists. Here's what Miscavige did not say in the war is over speech. In 1967, the IRS found that the Church of Scientology of California, the original mother church, monies inured to the personal benefit of L. Ron Hubbard and his family. That's why the Church of Scientology California in 67 lost tax exemption. The entity that got tax exemption was the Church of Scientology International. Right. So the unspoken admission, twofold. L. Ron Hubbard was guilty of inurement. Church of Scientology of California was disposed of quietly and without sorrow about 10 years later. See, if I ask you what happened to the Church of Scientology of California, it was a dirty church. Mm -hmm. It had engaged in inurement, and that's why you needed a new mother church that didn't have the stigma of inurement. Mm -hmm. So there was a tacit admission. Another thing to notice about tax exemption that I've often wondered about, 
a taxpayer who has a dispute with the IRS has the right to do an offer and compromise. Mm -hmm. So I always wondered, and this is where the Church of Scientology should become financially transparent. They should publish. See, their, their tax exemption with the IRS is secret. They came taxpayer privilege. Mm -hmm. If the tax exemption were so good, then they need to make it public. Just publish it online, publish all 14 feet of linear documents online and say, here, we, we, we went through this process, but they won't. Right. The other thing is they had, there was a five-year monitoring period, if you remember, after tax exemption. That was at CTCC, the Church uh, Tax Compliance Committee. Mm -hmm. That five years, to me, seems to be statutory in nature. That is, the church had five years of probation to keep whistle clean. And often this is done where, yes, you can have tax exemption, but if you screw up during these five years, you're going to have to pay back taxes and you lose your tax exemption. Right. So, so to me, it seemed like five years probation. But I agree with you in, in, in the main. Once they got tax exemption, they had that big constitutional protection, which they shouldn't have. It let them... It let them get away with human rights abuses. Right. It let them get away with RPF, RPF's RPF, you know, forced abortions, disconnection. Because when you consent to ecclesiastical discipline, you're basically screwed in America. Right. <laughs> you know, you have to quit or withdraw your consent to get out of it. Well, and even even though but, on the refunds and re refunds as well, like the Garcia case. Do you know what I mean? It's the same thing. It's like they set up their own, their own. Uh, it's a, it's almost like a kangaroo court. It's such a catch twenty two that the Garcias can never get uh, their, you know, their hearing before the arbitrator because the arbitrator has to be made up of Scientologists in good standing. Yet Scientologists in good standing will have to rule against them because they're declared suppressive people. And then the judge goes, well, that's that's the religion and that's that sort of thing. So I'm not going to rule on that. You're going to have to go through the arbitration. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So they exactly. use all this stuff. It's just a. It's just a whole. It, it's it's just a like a, uh, you know, a, a wheel that a that a uh, gerbil or something's running on a squirrel. You know, that is running around, 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 <laughs> and it's all, all set up as a game of cloak and dagger to protect the money and protect themselves. Sure, and that's part of tax exemption in America. The Church of Scientology International was created by lawyers to exploit. Uh, 501c3 tax exemption to the utmost. And they did, and they did a good job. I mean, if you think about it, you know, they did a good job because look where they're at right now. It's, it's, it's proved to be very durable. Yeah. So, well, Mark, I've enjoyed our interview. This is an interesting bit of history of how Miscavige really came to power through uh, a bloodless palace coup. And quite con quite to the contrary, what he argues now. But let me ask you this, because you 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 knew David Miscavige and worked with him for many years. Mm -hmm. His father writes a book called Ruthless, right. correct? Right. Now now Miscavige, you know, go attacks his dad, calls him every name in the book. Right. But but yet at the same time, Miscavige feels a need to validate his leadership in front of the Church of Scientology, because Scientologists are really the only people who are reading the hate website. Right. The general public's not. No. Why do you think right now in 2016, David Miscavige feels the need to argue that he's the rightful heir of uh, L. Ron Hubbard? Well, be What's because the, the thing is that if, if that if that confidence in him was shaken with the donor class in Scientology or Scientologists in general, then they would start looking outside and finding out the real truth in terms of what was going on and what has been going on. So he has to reiterate that that truth that he's the man and he's the one that was supposed to be there. So that way they uh, they don't go looking off somewhere else because you know if you think about it, uh, who's a more credible source than somebody's father or mother? You know that's a profound point you make. So if Miscavige is called into question by his own father. Who shows he, he you know he came to power through a series of machinations uh, then he has to double down on his bet and say no I'm the legitimate heir and and that's in order to reassure the uh, the elite class of donors correct that's that's a, a very good uh, insight into it when I agree with because that's what that's what took me by surprise the hate site itself is very trivial on on Ron Miscavige you just you know sort of neither here nor there Ron has acknowledged a lot of it himself, but but Dave, much of the videos, like for example, what stood out to me, Mark, 
you have uh, Jenny Alpers talking about how David Miscavige got involved in the design of the kitchen, the right. whole base design down to the last detail of the apartment. Right. The la the laundry room, the pool, yeah, he the had recreation. Such care about it, and, and he he wanted to make sure that you know the staff had the best of everything. You know what I mean? It was just sort of like it's such crap. But it also contradicts the whole statement to sign to the IRS about the fact that Miscavige didn't control anything. He didn't have any control over Scientology. He doesn't issue any orders when he approves every last brick as to where it goes. That's the actual fact. You know That's what I said in my article. In 1994, he doesn't have anything to do with running the church, and yet in 2016, when he's attacked, he's responsible for even the everything. Deluxe. He's responsible for everything, and not only that, Norman Starkey gets on his video and goes on about how Mr. Miscavige is responsible for this and that in this Church of Scientology all during this time period that he supposedly was over at Author Services Incorporated. So those videos completely contradict what they told the IRS in the first place. Oh, oh, exactly. It's and, a big foot bullet. I mean, they shot themselves in the foot trying to defend Miscavige. It actually undermines their position uh, for their uh, for, with the IRS and tax exempt status. Oh, I think it does. I think, and I think it's an important story and one that we'll be hearing more about. Yeah. Uh, and Mark, before we go, I have to ask you one more question. Sure. Did you like Ron Miscavige's book? Oh, yeah, I thought it was it was a great book. I loved the book because, uh, first of all, I knew Ron uh, very well when I was in, and we, our whole family has sort of a connection because they actually got, the Miscavige family actually got into Scientology and the mission, that the mission that my dad took over as the uh, executive director in the late 70s. And then my stepmother actually was, audit, was uh, one of the auditors uh, for uh, Loretta Miscavige and Ron Miscavige Sr., so um, we had a whole connection as far as that goes. But um, I thought the book was very well written because it was a father's story about his son and how his son went wrong. And there's a lot of criticism out there about the fact, well, he didn't go deep enough and he didn't do this and he didn't trash Scientology. But it's his story and his experience. And he got a lot of positive things out of Scientology through his lower grades and auditing. Um, but, you know, you got to give him credit for at least looking at his sons because a lot of fathers would not do that. They wouldn't, they, they wouldn't want to be a hypercritical of one of their children. Um, you know, you, you'd see that with, uh, you know, some mass murderer, you know, where the parents have to look at their kids and go, well, how did it happen? What did you do wrong? You know what I mean? Well, at least Ron was willing to go in and take a look and see what might have happened. Well, that's very insightful on your part. And we appreciate it. Always love having you on the show. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine, saying thank you for listening, and we'll be in very good touch.